I'm Francis Dernley, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, as international pressure builds on Germany to allow countries to send their leopard tanks to Ukraine, we discuss the latest announcements of weaponry being sent to Kyiv by Western countries and what it means to have one prime minister threatening to send the tanks without German permission. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. Putin's war in Ukraine has destabilized energy markets the world over. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from The Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Thursday, the 19th of January, day 330. And to discuss the most recent events in Ukraine and around the world, I'm joined by our associate editor, Dominic Nichols, our senior foreign correspondent, Roland Oliphant, on the ground in Kyiv, and by our regular commentator on German affairs, Dr. Thomas Clausen, who works at a liberal think tank in Berlin. I started by asking Dom for the updates in the military sphere in the past 24 hours. Yeah, hi Francis and hi everybody. It is uh, eventful, not so much on the battlefield, but more in the uh, the area of, of gifting. So Sweden, Estonia have, have um, said they're going to be sending more more arms. I'll be talking about those in, in a moment. Um, question mark about Poland. I'll leave that one for you to discuss, uh, France, because I know there's a lot more a lot more to it. But um, just to start with uh, Sweden. So the Swedish Swedish Prime Minister Ulf Christensen this morning, alongside his Defence Minister Pal Jonsson, said that they're going to be sending Archer artillery systems and CV90 infantry fighting vehicles. Now this is these are both very 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 good, very modern. They work. They are. Um, well, certainly the CV90 is much sought after and in service elsewhere around the world. Archer is a self-propelled 155mm howitzer on a wheeled, uh, wheeled 6x6 Volvo, Volvo chassis, so you know it's going to get there, um, even if it's playing ABBA the whole time. Um, the crew and the engine compartments are armoured, including um, bullet and frag-resistant windows, and the whole thing can be operated without the crew coming out of that armoured compartment. It can be... Um, bombed up, uh, so re, re, uh, resupplied by another by a support vehicle, for which they have to get out. But that takes less than ten minutes. But the whole the vehicle carries twenty one rounds of one five five mil uh, in a fully automatic magazine. So all of those can go without the crew even having to expose themselves to to fire. Um, rate of fire is good, about eight or nine rounds a minute, and it's got as some other modern systems like Caesar does, uh, the French Caesar system, a um, multiple round simultaneous impact mode, meaning it can fire several shells. If you imagine the barrel pointing straight up, fi- fi- firing around slightly lower, firing another round slightly f- lower, firing another round slightly lower, so on and so forth, then those rounds, because of the ballistic trajectory, they're going to land on the target, or it can be computed, so that all those rounds land on the target at the same time, which not only gives huge shock effects downrange at the, at the target end, um, and it's though it's that shock effect of artillery that, that that really kills. It's those first few seconds of rounds going off before people can get into cover and vehicles can get the hell out of the way. So it's that shock effect in the first few seconds that make, makes artillery such a killer. Um, so that is good that these these rounds all arrive at the same time. It also means that the that the vehicle the archer can can get out of the way uh, before return fire arrives. And um, the metric, the rough metric these days, although it's pretty accurate, it seems to be pretty accurate, is that you can expect return fire to come down on you within three minutes of firing and this this type of this type of ammunition. So that's what that's what physics and radars and all the rest of it means these days. The, the battlefield is a is a very, very dangerous place. A point I make when we talk about towed artillery that then needs to be hooked up and moved away by another vehicle. So self-propelled artillery is um, is the kind of name of the game, really. Now, Archer, the range, the main gun, it's uh, standard shell 30 kilometres, uh, 40Ks with base bleed. Now, base bleed is a, is a technique whereby the artillery shell allows, um, basically, if you can imagine, like when you're driving a car, you get all that, all that, um, all the, all the drag behind the car, the way the air moves over the vehicle and sort of then collects in the, in the back. That can slow down, you know, microscopically slows down your vehicle. It does the same thing, exactly the same thing with ballistic shells. So base bleed allows a little bit of 
um, forgive me for the <laughs> the technical details um, of sort of Janet and John here, but allows a little bit of air to bleed into out the back of the or around the back of the shell, so you don't have all those all that uh, that base drag for, as it goes through the air. Now that can extend the range by about twenty or thirty percent, um, and uh, yeah, which, which which takes it up to about forty k. Archer can also fire Excalibur out to about 50k, Excalibur being a precision-guided artillery round. So, very, very capable artillery system. Sweden, we think, has about 24 versions of the B model, about 48 uh, of all variants in service. And um, so we're not sure what's going, but we think it might be the, the B. They'd spoken earlier on, or on October last year, Swedish MOD was saying they were talking about sparing 12. So we would imagine a minimum of 12. Um, and they have today said that more detail on the CV-90, um, a tracked a, a tracked armoured fighting vehicle, 40 mil uh, gun, can be fitted with anti-tank rounds, can fit about six or seven troops in the back. So a, a very capable machine Um we think 50 are going to go now that that is significant so that that kind of number married up with a a significant um tank capability so as in sorry a, t- a tank um means that you've got the the makings there of an armored brigade so, and you need a sort of brigade size so you know, two or three thousand people probably 50 or 60 vehicles of each tanks and armored uh, sorry infantry fighting vehicles you need about that sort of size to make a brigade um, and that's just sort of the smallest real um, usable grouping on the on the battlefield. And that, but that can punch a hole. I mean, it's a very capable, um, very capable art, um, capability. That the trick is, of course, you need the vehicles, the infantry fighting vehicles, to be as fast as the tanks and and kind of well, not quite the same armored protection. But you've got to get on target. You've got to all arrive on target at the same time, or yeah, within the sort of the target area. So the tanks firing you right in, the, the infantry vehicles going up there to get the, the the men and women out the back to debust onto the position, preferably straight into the trenches and clear the trenches and, and clear the position and move on. Whilst the tanks are then looking for depth targets that might be trying to reinforce or any kind of mobile reserve that's counterattacking. So the the tanks move from firing you onto a position into then covering your flanks and looking for depth targets that are that are trying to move in to to get you out of that lodgement so you know what you need is a very well protected set of vehicles very fast similar capability in terms of firepower and speed to have that have that capability which at the moment there just there just isn't really the um, the tanks that that ukraine have and the same for the russian side to be honest it's sort of you, the main variant is the t-72 they're just not you know coupled with the bmps that are out there and the btrs they're just not it's just not the same in terms of an armored punch they are too vulnerable but this this is the start of a um, of a proper Ukrainian armoured capability. Now Alexei Reznikov, Ukraine's defence minister, he um, he tweeted his thanks. He said, even in the age of firearms, archers are useful for driving invaders out of Ukraine. Uh, and he thanked the Swedish people for what is the tenth package of Scudia assistance for Ukraine. And he said, our warriors will. Um, master the artillery and vehicles quickly. And I just wonder if he used that word warriors, our warriors, um, as a subtle hint to Britain to get the, our warrior infantry fighting vehicles out of the old, um, out of uh, Luggershall, get them, get all the grease wiped off them and send them out as well. But that's just speculation. But I mean, this is a, this is a sizable move. Of course, it comes in the context, as we'll speak in a moment, about, um, about tanks and Germany and leopards and so on and so forth. We'll speak about that in a moment. But a sizable move there from Sweden and Estonia. Likewise, another big aid package today. I think per capita, Estonia is leading the way. I think they've sent um, a roughly 3% GDP equivalent, which, like I say, is, is bigger than any other um, nation, including the United States. Obviously dwarfed in scale by the United States and, and others, but per capita. And why is that? Well, because they're, they're right on the front line. Okay, Estonia staring at this. They are very clear-eyed about the threat, and so they're also offering a package, the, the details of which is yet to fully come out. I'll just take a little pause there because I think, Francis, you might want to come back and and start introducing what's happening today with Poland. Thanks, Dom. Turning to Roland now, who's calling in from Kyiv, what's the latest on the helicopter crash yesterday that killed the interior ministers and several children? Yeah, so um, not that much more. I mean, the the authorities are still saying, look, it's too early to, um, to say what happened. Um, they're not being drawn on that. They're still saying 
um, look, we're looking at various different um, scenarios and, and you can break them down into you know, human error or technical malfunction or sabotage, but that doesn't really tell us anything. It just means that um, you know, they are um, investigating. There's a little bit more clarity. So I think we finished the day yesterday saying uh, 14 people killed. In fact, um, oh no, that, 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 that is where we're at. Okay, so it's, the final count was 14 dead. Um, 10 people on board the helicopter, not nine. Um, so four people on the ground died, including one child, 25 injured um, amongst them, um, 11 children. Um, the police are also interested in playing down this um, this idea that it was on fire. Now, w- we we had witnesses. There were a number of people yesterday who, who you know said they thought it was on fire. They saw it coming down on fire before it crashed. Um, the police are saying... We can't confirm that. Um, they they seem to be suggesting that was actually um, a bit of a rumor, and they're also the kind of um, more witness testimony, kind of talking about how uh, emphasizing the fog. It's been very foggy in 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 Kiev the past couple of days. It's pretty foggy right now, um, and and the idea being well, you know, the power was off as it often is, and so the lights on the on the on the apartment blocks weren't really working, and and therefore somehow this helicopter you know, got in amongst the nine story apartment blocks and, um, and, and, you know, found itself in a, in a tricky spot. Um, that again, to me is, is kind of speculation. I'd be, I don't know. I, I, I personally find it difficult to think that you, you would be flying at that altitude in that part of Kiev. Um, if you know anything about the place, which I'm sure the pilot did, um, in, in any kind of weather. Um, so investigation, um, ongoing, um, essentially, um, uh, other things here. I mean, the atmosphere here is, um, it's fairly calm at the moment, really in Kiev. Um, you know, mostly people seem to be over yesterday's drama. Um, it is unseasonably warm. Um, there is not a trace of snow on the ground, which is, um, utterly bizarre. Uh, we had an aircraft, uh, sorry, an, an air raid warning earlier today. Um, but not a very serious one, um, Nothing really happened. Um, so that's where we are uh, over here. Thanks, Roland. And you've sort of answered my my question, but I just wanted to say or, or, or put to you, you've obviously been a- away from Ukraine for a few weeks. And I just wanted to ask what your biggest surprise was, if any, on, on what you've seen since you arrived in Kiev, whether there was anything that, that leapt out of you as being different from when you were last in Ukraine. I don't know. I mean, when I left last time in autumn it was just the beginning the russians had just begun their their big bombing campaign against infrastructure um so i was here for the like, the first big attack um back in october and it's kind of happened every 10 10 day 10 to 12 days or a week to 12 days um you know there was another wave of um of bombings um and we had one was it uh, just a uh, just over a week ago is it or less than a week ago with this with terrible strike on Dnipro um, which everyone uh, was following 44 people dead in the end there um, I mean the, the the city seems very resilient all the cities seem resilient um, I came up through Odessa um, life is going on um, I must say Kiev is it's definitely not as busy and not as full as it was before the war this is still you know a certain absence of humans from this, this, this sprawling city. But, um, you know, you can, <laughs> you can feel the petrol fumes in the air again. Um, you know, the, the, there was a period when this city was basically empty and you could kind of walk around and, and breathe sweet, fresh air and kind of pretend, wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have cars? Well, well that's gone. Um, uh, you know, life continues. People have, the, the city's adapted very well to this, um, you know, these, these bombardments and what's it means. Um, you know, people are carrying their head torches around um, because the lights go out at night, the street lights go out partly, uh, you know, mostly to save energy. Um, so people, people are keep a, keep a torch with them so cars can see them. Um, and so you don't, you know, fall down um, in a pothole. Um, uh, this morning's air raid. Um, so I only noticed it um, when I kind of happened to flick open the, the air raid app because there wasn't any siren. Um, and I asked a friend, I said, is there an air raid? I said, yeah, yeah, but don't worry, it's, it's not it's not a bad one. I said, how do you know? He goes, well, if they really think something's going to happen, they preemptively turn off the power, and they haven't, so we're probably fine. And um, we were. Um, so a sense, I suppose, of, uh, would you say normalisation of war? I mean, you can kind of tell that this war has been going on for nearly a year now. 
um you know it's it's we're deep into it and society and people have adapted the shock the initial shock is is faded long ago um and i don't know i mean think back to you know all those old war movies about the home front and and, and things like that you know it's that kind of thing Not, nothing nothing's quite normal but you know um you can get the train places um you can do stuff conversations are dominated by you know um by what's going on at the front things like that um there was a chap I, you know speaking on the train about how you know he's evaded you know he's he's managed not to get drafted so far his wife doesn't want to go but his mates were in as of regiment and as of style and he's you know waiting for his call i mean this is just those are the conversations that that are just everywhere because it is it is a country at war um but at the moment it's it's I don't know, eerily calm, weirdly calm. There's definitely a bit of a lull on um, at the moment. Um, and I think everyone's um, quite grateful to take a, a bit of a breath um, because the, the anticipation is that things are going to get, you know, going to get pretty bad again in the spring. Thank you, Roland. Before I turn to our guest, Dr. Thomas Clausen, to discuss the pressure mounting on Germany, I think it's just important to contextualise the situation via some diplomatic reaction and announcements. Already we're hearing from Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky that Germany is making a mistake over the tanks. So he is criticising the hesitation by Germany about it not supplying its modern Leopard tanks yet. Of course, this is all building up to Rammstein on Friday. I'll read the direct quote. There are times when we shouldn't be hesitating or shouldn't compare. When someone says, I will give tanks if someone else will also share tanks. I don't think this is the right strategy to go with. We've already talked, or Dom has, about how Sweden are planning to send archer artillery to Ukraine, how Estonia are sending aid. There's also been another update from Canada. Canada are pledging to send 200 armoured personnel carriers to Ukraine with anti-chemical attack systems. Very, very advanced. Again, speaking to the urgency coming from them at the moment. But the most interesting update in this space this morning is about Poland. Poland's prime minister has suggested that he could go at it alone as Warsaw is growing tired of Germany's refusal to sanction the delivery of Leopard 2 tanks to Ukraine. Quite a big story this. Joe Barnes has written about it, of course, a regular on our podcast for our website. I'll read the quote from the Polish prime minister. Permission is a secondary matter. We will either get it quickly or do what we see fit. As I say, very, very striking remarks this. Now, I should say, we don't know what the ramifications would be if they did decide to go alone and ignore Germany's wishes on the matter, if Germany were to say no, which at this stage is still an if. But nonetheless, having a country break ranks on Ukraine in terms of the unity that the West has had so far is quite striking. And I think that we should watch this very, very closely because if Germany says no, then I think we're going to see pressure from the Baltics and from Poland, perhaps even from Britain, to say, well, we are going. We think it's the right thing for you to do to, to send the Leopard 2 tanks anyway. And whilst that will drive a wedge between Germany and other powers, I think it will also put a measurable pressure on Germany to respond. And as I say, you can already see just how much pressure is already mounting on Germany as we speak. So turning to Berlin now, Thomas, you're there. What's the latest from Germany and the resignation of its former defence minister and the new one who's just just been installed? Um, Yeah, good to be here. Um, So I think these are uh, quite a few questions. So maybe we should start with the more uh, basic one of who is the new uh, defence minister and why did the old one step back? So to start with uh, Lambrecht, who was the uh, defence minister since the... uh, beginning of the Scholz coalition, there were a number of gaps. She has been uh, criticized quite heavily uh, over the time for not being in touch with the army, for essentially not caring enough. And then there was a weird Instagram video at New Year's Eve where she was sort of uh, expressing her thankfulness for the opportunity uh, that the war brought about in terms of meeting interesting new people, etc all white who are standing in front of fireworks, uh, Berlin fireworks. So there was a damning article at the beginning of the year in the Spiegel, and then she stepped back. It doesn't really seem that um, Scholz was that well prepared because it took quite a few days to replace her. And there was some, there was a huge search going on 
a lot of questions who could become the next uh, Minister of Defense. And this is quite significant because uh, at one point, uh, Lambrecht sort of said her goodbye. She blamed the media for being a bit too harsh on her. She did not mention Ukraine in her uh, final statement, which is a bit uh, odd, given uh, that this is, of course, the, the, ma the most significant challenge for any defense minister in Europe since 1945. But uh, then there was some sort of empty space for about a day uh, where basically Germany had no formal commander-in-chief of the armed forces because even if she resigns until a new one is appointed, uh, she would have had to stay, but uh, she didn't. Anyways, uh, that episode is over. Now we have a new one who is uh, Boris Pistorius. And he's a bit of a surprise choice, but not quite as much as some people say. For instance, he had already been tipped uh, to become the federal minister of the interior after the last election. So um, for quite a while, uh, since 2013, I think, he's been the minister of the interior in Lower Saxony. And that's one of Germany's largest states. So it's also home of um, a lot of facilities of the armed forces. Um, and in his time as uh, Minister of the Interior, he gained a reputation for being supportive of the security forces, for being tough on crime, including uh, terrorism, football hooligans, Islamist extremists, etc. And one of his main projects in recent time was improvement of civil defense. So he's not uh, that much of an odd choice. In fact, uh, I think he might fit in uh, quite well. Finally, he's also been part of NATO's uh, parliamentary assembly as an alternate member. And in 2020, he attended, for instance, a few meetings of the committee on, civil, uh, on the civil dimension of security. And finally, and this uh, matters uh, in Germany, although he's a lawyer by training, he also completed his mandatory civil uh, military service in the early 1980s. That doesn't mean that much, of course, but it might gain him at least some respect with the military. So um, it's not so probably a good choice by uh, Scholz, at least given the, the number of available candidates. Um, there were other names in the ring, but he is here at least has some... Um, standing uh, as a security expert and he knows uh, how to lead a ministry. Thank you. Yeah, very interesting to hearing a little bit more about about this figure and what we can perhaps expect from him. As I say, I'm very interested in what the general mood is in Germany at the moment. I mean, obviously, on this podcast, we've been following the mounting pressure on Germany in recent days and weeks. Is there a sense of that pressure in Germany at the moment that all eyes are on them? Or are they perhaps a little bit distracted by other domestic affairs? Certainly safe to say there has been a lot of movement in the debate. So uh, a few months ago, sending leopards was a red line and some people uh, in the government and in the coalition, uh, in particular Rolf Mützenich, said it's a red line that was uh, unlikely to be crossed. And now it seems as if uh, Germany tomorrow hopefully will, um, I mean, they have to, I, I would say, they have to agree that other countries send leopards, but I would also not be surprised if there's some movement regarding Germany sending tanks. Um, as was mentioned before, uh, Scholz said in a telephone call to Biden, apparently, that he was only willing to send um, leopards if uh, America was sending uh, heavy tanks as well. Um, this is, by the way, I think not that unusual. It's, it has been Scholz's line since the very beginning. I think it's a line that's not completely unpopular in Germany. Uh, and after all, I mean, Germany is not a nuclear power on its own right. And uh, we talked uh, on the podcast for quite a, uh, some time on this German angst of nuclear escalation, which probably is uh, more, uh, more visible and feelable here than in uh, other European countries. And this is, can be also be seen if we look at a few surveys that have been done, for example, by the ZEF, that's a, a broadcasting um, station in Germany, they asked at the beginning of January um, how, uh, how the German population sees the delivery of certain types of tanks. And the results are a bit curious because they are quite specific if one, uh, given that the population, uh, including myself, are not uh, military experts. But when it came to the questions whether they support um, the, the martyrs, so the lighter uh, type of tanks, then 59% of Germans were in favor of sending those uh, types of tanks and 33% were against it. But when the question came to Leopards 2, only 42% of Germans were in favor and 46% um, were against it. So 
I don't think that actually it tells you that much about um, sort of the, I don't think that the people who responded to this type of leopards are available in certain European countries. I think it's, it's a general, it's, it, it shows a general nervousness amongst uh, substan substantial uh, strata of the German population about escalating too much, which of course I would uh, personally disagree with. Um, I think the threat of Russia winning is much bigger and it it's also brings about a bigger potential for escalation than if Russia is stopped as quickly as possible. But uh, that is unfortunately a debate in Germany. And also, if we look at a different uh, survey that was done by Infratest DMAP for the RD, Germany's main television um, broadcasting service, they there was one question was whether the support of Ukraine with weapons is going far enough or not. And only 25% that said it's not going far enough, 41% said it's about right, and 26% said it's going too far. So one can see quite a split in the German population, but also a lot of hesitancy and I think also um, a lack of direction and I think maybe even a lack of actual understanding of the, the, the mood in, in other countries. Finally, also when it came to the question of sanctions, 35% said they are not going far enough, 35% said they are about right, and 19% said they are going too far. So again, there seems to be uh, around 20 to 25 percent of Germans who think that uh, it's now uh, it, support for Ukraine has been going too far, but then a more vocal or the, um, slightly bigger uh, chunk of the German population says, well, it's, it's not going um, far enough. And finally, and I think this is the most worrisome um, a result of uh, this particular survey that was done uh, in early January, whether there needs to be more diplomatic endeavors to uh, uh, um, uh, to bring about peace, and fifty two percent of Germans says that diplomatic efforts aren't going far enough. And this is, of course, a ludicrous uh, position to take, I would say, because it's very clear that uh, Russia is not interested in any type of diplomacy. I mean, we've had phone calls by Scholz even at the beginning of December, so I think one can hardly say that there has been a lack of diplomatic efforts. But it's clear that um, at least the opinion polls uh, give him some support. Thank you. I was very struck by what you were saying there, Thomas, about many in Germany perhaps not being aware of some of the strength of feeling around Europe and the wider world about what's going on at the moment. And this speaks to a piece I read this morning in The Guardian by Timothy Garton Ash, who a historian, amongst many other things, and he argues, and I'll, I'll read a quote here, this has become a litmus test of Germany's courage to resist Putin's nuclear blackmail, overcome its own domestic cocktails of fears and doubts, and defend a free and sovereign Ukraine. Schultz's speech at the World Economic Forum on Wednesday gave no hint of such boldness. But in stepping to the front of a European leopard plan for Ukraine, Scholz would be showing German leadership that the entire West would welcome. He would also be learning the right lessons from Germany's recent and very recent history. And just picking up on that, I wonder if we're seeing an example here with Germany of a country in some sense being immobilised by its own history. In, it's sort of seeking a specific objective and it's trying to learn from history how to achieve that objective. But in so doing, it's actually making different errors that ultimately undermine their overall strategic goal. And, and I'm sort of wondering, you know, I, I, how many of the political class in Germany have read our mutual friend, Professor Christopher Clark's book, Sleepwalkers, about the diplomatic errors that led to World War One and are being cautious as a result yet them doing that they're making an error that potentially leads to something closer to what they're trying to avoid for fear of escalation i'm not trying to say we're on the precipice i should say but only that perhaps we're in a scenario where strength not caution is more advisable but what do you think about this idea of germany being potentially immobilized by its history when it comes to to history i think there are a few um, other aspects that uh, come to mind that might explain some of the uh, misguided ways of understanding the present conflict. One is, of course, that, for example, that Germany's, so Nazi Germany's um, attack on the Soviet Union was not just an attack on uh, Russia, but that the Soviet, that some of the victims came from Ukraine, came from Belarus, etc. So this is the first part, that sort of there's a conflation of the Soviet Union and Russia, uh, which means that Ukraine is a bit of, a, in that 
sort of the reality of Ukraine and Ukraine's history in the 20th century is not really understood because all eyes are always on Moscow. Then, of course, I think, and we've talked about this before, I think when it comes to understanding uh, the history of the Baltics, of Poland, etc., there's also a bit of a gap, and one can see this uh, if one sort of looks at the type of memorials in, in Berlin even. So we have the old Soviet memorials um, where um, that Germany has uh, pledged to um, maintain as part of the 4 plus uh, 2 treaty at the beginning of the 1990s. And they, of course, tell the uh, misleading story of the Great Patriotic War from 41 to 45. So here, um, Germany and uh, the Soviet Union's uh, attack on Poland, for example, doesn't go uh, mentioned. Then we have a number of other types of memorial, but for example, no specific memorial for the attack on Poland. So there's been some debate for quite quite some time to include uh, Polish victims in some memorial, but it hasn't been completed yet. And that shows that this is a discussion that um, uh, that has been going on for some while, but it isn't as far as other aspects of Germany's uh, coming to terms with the past. Um, now, when it comes to the sleepwalkers and Germany being afraid, I mean, I have to say that it's also a bit surprising almost that uh, people look to Germany for leadership because, as I mentioned at the beginning, Germany is not a nuclear power. So um, they, they have been fully sovereign, arguably only since the 4 plus 2 treaties. It was always clear that Germany's uh, security politic had to be tied in some way or other to, to the West and to NATO in particular. So I don't find it quite as odd uh, of Scholz to be looking to uh, America for, for leadership in this question. But of course, it would have been much more preferable if Germany had stepped forward many months uh, before and made a suggestion for a sort of common um, program for supplying leopards. And the key question here, um, and I think uh, Dom mentioned this at the beginning, is logistics. The countries have to streamline the process, to start training, to um, start production of uh, uh, necessary equipment. I think it would have been good for Germany to have uh, made some proposal earlier, um, but it probably will happen now. And uh, maybe the, the final uh, aspect, and that came about when Annalena Baerbock, um, Germany's Minister of Foreign Affairs, visited uh, Ukraine a few uh, weeks ago, uh, Kuleba was very clear that uh, it was not sort of the decision of Germany in that sense to be reluctant, but that it was uh, down to the dynamics of the coalition. So I think the Greens would be very happy to send uh, tanks as quickly as possible. The Defense Committee at the Bundestag has been quite vocal about this. And it's, I would say that uh, the sort of the hesitation uh, comes mainly from the Chancery. Interesting. Thank you. Dom, Roland, you've been listening to this. What have you got question-wise for, for Thomas? Starting with you, Dom. Sure. Well, hi, Thomas. Great to have you back. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Where do you think this position, this, this reluctance on behalf of Charles Schultz, where does that leave his uh, Zeitenwend, the, um, the once-in-a-generation tectonic shift in security architecture that he described a few months ago? He said the war... This war is is a you know, moment for Ze it's the Zeitenwende. It's, it's going to change everything, and yet he seems very quickly to have gone back to a fairly traditional position. I mean, does that mean that he that he's does that speak of any greater reluctance, or that his initial analysis was was somehow wrong? Do you think? Um, I think it's probably fair to say that uh, Scholz is more on the reluctant side, and that he is uh, driven both by external pressure and by pressure from within the coalition. And in that sense, it's quite disappointing that. He, hasn't, he doesn't seem to have taken fully on board the implications of the Seitenwende. But when I um, mentioned the, the opinion polls and I, I referred to the dynamics also within his party, it's also, I think, um, it, it's, one needs to uh, remind oneself of how big of a shift uh, this uh, Seitenwende is for Germany. So essentially, the politics vis-a-vis -vis Russia from the last 16 years or so are now back to the sort of cozying up to Putin or to Russia. So there will, this shift will probably happen sooner than later, but it's unnerving to see that it still takes um, so much um, uh, yeah, reluctance um, or that it's still going um, so reluctantly and only after Germany has been pressured by uh, either, uh, either from, from within by 
uh, by the coalition, in particular the, the Greens and the Liberals, or within certain um, or within the, the um, alliance. However, I do think that in the long run, um, hopefully, the, the shift will be completed. Thank you. I think I, I, I probably should have started, actually. Would you mind, please, just giving us a, a quick recap on what the Zeitenwende is, please, Thomas? So the Zeitenwende goes back to Scholz's speech uh, on the 27th of February, where he said that uh, Russia's full, full-out full attack on Ukraine marks this tectonic shift. So, And that in the same uh, moment, he was pledging 100 billion Euro, uh, euros for the refurbishment of the Bundeswehr. And I mean, to be fair, he has sort of, there was some stepping back from that. So now some of the money is used to to reach the 2% goal, not even this year, but in the future. And when he made the point uh, about the Zeitenwende, it seemed as if he meant that there's now this 100 billion euros, which wouldn't even have been enough, uh, in addition to the uh, to fulfilling the 2% goal of um, defense spending per GDP. And in that sense, yes, he's been uh, going back and forth. But I would say this is this owes much, first of all, to to the dynamics within his party. So we have still uh, people who are sort of stuck in, in the old ways and who are talking about diplomacy with Russia and de-escalation. And this is quite a, this is, I would say, dragging on, on Scholz. And he probably himself isn't quite uh, quite so keen to implement the Zeitenwende. And I think the biggest problem uh, is not just the, the delivery of uh, weapons, because if one looked at the countries who have, who have been supplying uh, weapons, uh, so, I mean, of course, the UK and US are leading. And if, if, if we look at the per capita support, it's clear that also the Baltics and Poland, etc., are much, much ahead. But Germany isn't the, the sort of the last one. It's just that the strategic communication has been a disaster. And I think that's partially because a lot of the communication is inwards. So in order to sort of manage a, a mood in the population that is quite hesitant at times, especially uh, in the heartlands of the SPD and in, in Lower Saxony, but also uh, in East Germany. So I think the fact that we are talking about Germany is, is I mean, it, that's remarkable in the sense that I don't think that Germany or that Scholz is thinking that uh, other countries are talking so much about Germany. And th- this is, of course, rare. I like it, it, it doesn't make any sense. But I would say that Germany's discussion is mainly a domestic uh, discussion. And it's not considered uh, to a large extent that uh, other countries are listening very, very closely what's what's going on. Thanks, Thomas. Is there more going on here with Germany's uh, position and Schultz's statements? Are there more? Is there more politics here about who the big guy in Europe is when it comes to defence? Because the the context of leopards was framed around who's going to move first. We don't want to be alone, and it was all in main battle tanks. Yada yada yada. Britain then said, made the announcement earlier this week about Challenger Two, which by anyone's benchmark is a pretty good tank. Um, and then and then we're back to oh no 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 it's the M M one Abrams it's the U S that we're talking about. So it, it wasn't who's going to jump first with heavy tanks. It's all about the U S. So I mean, was that the position all along? Do you think, or is there some sort of perceived? Um, a wrestling match about you know, who, who's the who's the defence player in Europe, and, and Germany is sort of saying, well, actually, it's not you, Britain. It's it's, it's still the US, um, and so on and so forth. Um, I don't think so. In a way, it's because uh, also the entire debate is quite unnerving. So it's, at some point, it seemed that there was a debate in Germany whether there's a difference between offensive tanks, tank, whereas the Leopard is an attack tank, and that's something completely different. And uh, Ukraine's uh, social media team, uh, which has been doing a stellar job so far, I think also picked up on this because they were uh, launching uh, a t- this short video on Twitter a few days ago where they uh, introduced the Leopard as a sort of a Zidane car, but not a, um, not a tank. So this entire naming debate is, is a bit ridiculous. I think it shows that there's quite some nervousness in Germany still about what move might uh, lead to further escalation. But I don't think that it's necessarily about who is leading within Europe. There's probably just the main understanding. And I mean, partially this is true, that it's, it's uh, 
the only country that can really make a difference in, in this war is the United States, or that's at least the, the main player so far. It's just ridiculous if one looks at the, the broader debates that have been going on in Europe for years about strategic autonomy. There's, there were some anti-American sentiments uh, in recent years, etc. And now it comes back to, well, we can't really do anything without the U.S., um, it's it's a bit unfortunate, but I think it will um, it will change at least in the medium term. It's just um, quite uh, enraging that the slowness of the debate just means uh, that uh, more Ukrainian soldiers are going to die needlessly because they are sitting in a, a Soviet tank rather than in uh, tanks that are better suited at protecting uh, the soldiers. And by the way, this is an argument that was made by a member of the um, Defense Committee of the Bundestag, Anton Hofreiter, who who is who was for a long time seen basically as a standard left wing member of the Green Party, and who now explained to his voters why he is starting to be so interested in tanks. And his point was exactly that: that knowing a bit about the armament, knowing a bit about what capabilities certain tanks have, means make being able to make informed decision about at the end of the day, protecting the lives of Ukrainian soldiers. And it's just very unnerving that this is, um, in a way, not a minority position, but not a position that is shared by the entirety of the coalition. Thanks both. Roland, you've been listening to this. Any questions for Thomas? I think I think you've covered it all very well, Thomas. I mean, I suppose here's, there's two, and they're, they're quite blunt questions. Um, the first is, um, you know, we've got Politico reporting now that the answer tomorrow at Ramstein is going to be no, and we're not giving tanks unless the Americans provide Abrams. Um, there is all kinds of pressure debate. Is that your sense? That's what the answer is going to be? Or do you have a sense that actually shows is going to crack and suddenly, you know, that the leopards will be unleashed? That's number one. The second one is, I mean, I'm frankly struggling with this. I, I, just, I just can't grasp the rationale, because it seems to me that, you know, first it's like, oh, escalation, what does that mean? Then it's like, well, somebody, you know, we're not going to act alone, we're going to act in concert. So Britain sends MBTs, and it's like, oh, no, we meant the Americans. I mean, even if the Americans provide, like, five Abrams, um, I mean, do you think he would shift it again? I mean, do you think that actually he just doesn't want to do this, and he's not going to do this? And my my blunt question um, <laughs> that this is leading up to is, I mean, do you think Olaf Scholz wants Ukraine to win the war? Or would he, is he uncomfortable with that? I think he is very uncomfortable with uh, the entire war. And he is, I think there's a general sense of fear um, about nuclear escalation, um, which I don't think makes uh, that much sense. But it's certainly a sentiment that's been deeply ingrained in, uh, in the, the Federal Republic. And, le- and this goes back to the 1950s. I think one of the earliest episodes with Francis, I mentioned this book, um, Republic of Fear, where um, a German historian was sort of um, was interpreting uh, Germany's recent history through the prism of a society that is quite success- uh, susceptible to fears of uh, nuclear escalation, but also all sorts of different uh, panics about from climate change to to the dying of forests, etc. So it is sometimes a bit of a nervous society, and Scholz is probably attuned to that. But then again, I, I am also a bit uh, flabbergasted by the, the state of the debate. I think it has something to do with strategic culture. But there's, I mean, for example, in, in Britain, we have the Institute for the Study of War. We don't have something similar in Germany. We have some very federal armed force universities, excellent uh, military experts from various think tanks. Um, for example, uh, Ulrike Franke, who did a PhD at Oxford on drones. And um, they all make very sensible points. It's just that I think the overall strategic culture is just not uh, at a point where it should be. And this, unfortunately, probably also um, plays into Scholz's um, favoring. I don't really think he wants, like, I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to, to say what's actually going on in Scholz's head. His claim that Germany would only send leopards if the Americans send Abrams seems um, uh, difficult to, to, to grasp. It might also mean that if, if the US commits to a few Abrams, then suddenly everything changes. We've seen quite a few uh, 
changes in Germany's uh, position regarding what can be sent. So at the beginning, we had the 5,000 helmets from uh, Lambrecht. Um, then we went to uh, air defense system. Then after a while to the to the Panzerhaubitze 2000. And then finally to tanks, which was seen as a red line beforehand. So I would ex assume that the red lines are going to shift uh, as well, at some point, Germany will send leopards. I, I can't really see Germany not permitting uh, other countries to send uh, leopards to Ukraine. That would be a disaster. But I'm not sure what uh, will come out of the meeting tomorrow. And maybe uh, Scholz doesn't know yet uh, either. Thank you, Roland. Well, we're running out of time today. So if I could just come to your final thoughts now, starting with you, Dom, what would you like to leave our listeners with? Well, firstly, an apology. I said earlier on that the, the latest package of aid today from Estonia, that's remote fire weapons and anti-tank weapons, takes their, their total up to about 3% of GDP. That's that's correct. That's Sorry, that's incorrect. I mean, they are still per capita the biggest, uh, biggest supplier, but it takes them to just over 1% of GDP. So the package today was about $122 million. That takes their total up to $370 million, just over 1% of GDP. So apologies for that, but Estonia still per capita um, the biggest uh, supplier of military aid to, to Ukraine. What I'll leave you with, though, is, is what we were, we were talking about yesterday with Aliona. Uh, we were talking about um, Putin in Leningrad uh, at the... Um, 80th anniversary of the raising of the siege of Leningrad from the Second World War and how this was a notable event and he likes these notable events to make great pronouncements and was this going to be the moment he used the W word um, would he call for mobilisation and so on and so forth now it was very telling that he that he said nothing or rather he okay he gave, gave a speech at a factory but just reiterated his standard sort of long standing Kremlin rhetoric about you know Nazis and, and all the rest of it so nothing nothing new and this is the the third time of note that he's failed at a at a, a major public um, event not to not do anything with his speech because he didn't say anything in his New Year's speech and he cancelled his annual address to the Russian Federation Assembly. So people were questioning what what's going on here. And uh, I mean, the short answer is we don't know unless you're some uh, massive Kremlinologist, in which case I'd love to hear from you. But I mean, what he did say yesterday about the usual Nazis and uh, all that kind of blarney um, is probably just to shore up his the pro-war community. He, he's kind of got to throw them a bit of red meat. So fine, they, they go and chew on that. That's brilliant. Um, but this side has been that area has been increasingly critical of him. So he's got to he's got to keep them sweet. Um, so it, it was a kind of non-speech speech yesterday. The more this goes on, of course, then we become very, very interested if he's not uh, saying anything. Medvedev, of course, uh, former former president and um, his sort of his kind of attack dog, if you like, head of the National Security Council. He's uh, yeah, he's going on. But he's pressing the old nuclear rhetoric button again. Fine. We kind of ignore that now. It's kind of priced into the market. But the longer Putin goes past these these major milestones, these dates and these events without saying something significant or just throwing a little bit of a little bit of stuff for his uh, for his uh, community, the ultra war community, then then I think that is very, very telling that he's not using this information, uh, clunky term coming up, uh, 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 information space to his advantage. But yeah, we'll keep an eye out for that. Thank you, Dom. Roland, can I just come to you next for your final thoughts? Final thoughts. Look, I, I think I think you've all done a very good job about talking about tanks today, because that is really what's dominating the you know the conversation here in Kiev. I mean, you know, Dmitry Kuleba this morning was, um, and and Alexei Reznikov, you know, the foreign and defence ministers put out. First thing I woke up to in the morning was a was a joint statement from them, basically saying, you know, let the tanks go. Um, we need these things. Um, the challenges, are not, we're grateful for the challenges, but we're not enough. We need the leopards and very, very direct appeal to all the countries who operate them. Make a tank alliance, give us those tanks. That's what we need to win. Um, you know, Zelensky's made comments about, um, look, I don't think that saying, oh, I'll do something if someone else will do it is, is the right thing. You know, direct kind of almost demands for for Germany to act, everything is focused on 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 this meeting tomorrow, and 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 the feeling is that, you know, the time has come. If Ukraine is going to win this war, or even if it's going to see off this um, this anticipated uh, great big Russian spring push, wherever that's going to come from, um, they need these things, um, and it's it's got to happen. So, yeah, all all, all about <laughs> all about tanks um and all of that um you, you've covered a lot of that so i won't drone on there's, there's one other thing um that i 
uh, I noticed. Um, so uh, an old colleague and friend of mine, Dmitry Belyakov, he's a Russian war photographer um, who has worked with us on the Telegraph over the years. Um, uh, you know, greatly, greatly talented photographer. He's um, he, he's written a piece for the uh, University of Norwich um, uh, describing you know, uh, describing kind of Russian war propaganda, and you know what what kind of ordinary Russians are absorbing from from TV and the news and the message. Um, and I'd I'd advise you to read it because it's I mean it, it's not it's not eloquent it's not kind of a perfectly crafted uh, piece of work, but it's so angry and it and it and it is such an encapsulation of the utter the utter degradation. Um, of 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 this war, what this war has done to kind of Russian public rhetoric um, and and the message around it, and that gives you a sense of how you know some Russians feel about you know what, what the, the the horrible shame and the disgust um, about <laughs> what this war has you know has done to their country, is doing to Ukraine, um, all of that. Um, I, I, I would give that a look if you want to, you know, get a sense of just how, you know, how 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 kind of disgusting um, the Kremlin's messaging is on this, and how cynical it is, um, and, and what the what the Russian public are being are being sold. Thanks, Roland. And nice to hear a reference to Norwich on the podcast. It's my hometown. But turning to Berlin to end, Thomas, we'll give you the floor for your final thoughts. We, we have to take on board the sort of the disgusting nature of, of Russia's propaganda, including, by the way, the threat uh, by some members of the Duma to kill our foreign minister. And I think this needs to be given a much more prominent role in, in German debates on support for Ukraine. But I would like to end with a quote from Boris Postorius, who is now a Minister of Defense from May 2022, that was unearthed by uh, the Spiegel in their portrait of Pistorius. It was made in a rather obscure television format. And there Pistorius said, uh, the reconquest of occupied territories by Ukraine is legitimate and absolutely right and must also be supported by us. Ukraine must win the war. And all I can say is that I really hope that as a Minister of Defense, he takes this message on board and that uh, he can play, uh, despite the fact that he's been rather soft on Russia before the 24th of February, that as a Minister of Defense, he will hopefully uh, uh, lead the way or at least provide some uh, provide much more support for Ukraine than his predecessor. But let's see. Um, I don't think he has 100 days. I think he needs to move much quicker. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first 30 days completely free at telegraph.co.uk slash audio. Or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine Live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day plus insights from our regular commentators on this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm weekday on Twitter Spaces. Just follow The Telegraph on Twitter so that you don't miss it. And if UK politics is your thing, I'd recommend that listeners also check out Christopher Hope's podcast, Chopper's Politics, which at the moment, for obvious reason, includes a lot of commentary on what's going on in Ukraine with senior British political figures. As ever, if you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. We've noticed a really big spike in those recently. So thank you very, very much. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing podcasts at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. We're especially interested to hear where you're listening from around the world. We'll also try and respond to as many questions from you as we can on Twitter. And you can find our Twitter handles in the show notes for this episode. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Giles Gear, And today on Twitter, Claire Hubble.